This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a super smart lady to speak with me, Dr. Emma Byrne, who holds a PhD in AI from UCL. And she spent the best part of a decade building robots, neural networks, and looking into swearing and pain and all of that cool stuff. She wrote a great book called Swearing is Good for You. And so we discussed swearing, its effect on us physically and emotionally, and swearing with kids, and should they be swearing, and the social impact and all of that cool stuff so enjoy hey it's lewis welcome to the podcast enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere awesome and we're live emma thank you very much for coming in thanks for having me pleasure how was your journey here it was fun um (laughs) it was it was the central line so i managed to not swear but that's not through anyone of wanting to swear. You wanted to swear. Um, that could be busy, yeah. that line. I just, I wish that people would figure out that when they lean on the doors, it makes them open slightly and then the train stops. And then, oh, and then it's the same person who's been leaning on the door who's going, no, oh, why are we stuck? And it's like, just stop. Nightmare. Leaning on the door. So, yeah. But I'm oh, well. here now. But it got you here. It got me here. And then Which is the uh, thing. I forgot the warren of streets that is around here. Oh, around here is a nightmare. The, uh, yes. Most uh, people come end up coming to our back entrance. I did. Oh, you did? Exactly fine, that. fine. Yes. Um, thank you, Google Maps. So what is your, what's your background? You're a doctor. Oh, yeah. Not the cool. useful kind. I cannot fix any ailments of the body or mind. Uh, but I can tell you how to build various different sort of machine learning and evolutionary algorithms. Also tell you quite a bit about structures in the brain and how they do cool and interesting interesting things. I did computational neuroscience for a while looking at how we learn to see colours and how we understand our visual environments and not just us as humans but basically anything that has to try to make sense of the visual environment and then I spent some time uh, with a fantastic American researcher whose dream it was to teach a virtual robot, not a real robot, but a virtual robot running around this maze seeing various things to teach it language in the way that we teach children language and using a kind of neural network that isn't really used commercially because it's super expensive to build right, right. Uh, called a cell assembly but which is very much like the way that our neural activation works in the brain a cell assembly cell assembly so it's a guy called Donald Hebb or D.O. Hebb right. back in the very early 20th century before we had I think before we even had EEG machines certainly before fMRI scanners um, and he posited this idea that rather than a memory being held in a single neuron, this idea of a grandmother neuron, that they're held in assemblies of cells and that those assemblies are activated by other assemblies. And it's kind of like a whisper network. So right, right. you might hear something that sounds like a, a cat meowing and then you feel something furry and your brain is going, that cat, 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 because all of the adjacent neurons to those particular areas that are getting that activation are starting to work in concert. And we tend to, even neuroscientists, we tend to talk about these things that are dualists, like this activation means that you think of a cat, but actually that activation is the process of thinking cat. Right. So it, it's really hard to wean yourself off that dualism that neurons do something and then you have a thought. It's, no, neurons do things and that is the thought. And we right. managed to get... Can we, and, we can, and you can prove this and... Well, now we can see those sorts of... Uh, levels of activation going on in the brain but the most interesting way that it's been recorded sort of slightly creepy is you you take things like rats or rabbits or cats and you do something called decorticating them so taking right. a bit of the brain off and putting in um, electrodes that speak to particular neurons or very small populations of neurons and you watch how that activation in the brain happens while this poor bunny is sort of <laughs> jumping around with all these something out of Hannibal Lecter which is why I'm too squeamish to do that stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. computational neuroscience is a nice way of doing it you you basically say, is it theoretically possible that this yeah. would happen? And what are at least the sufficient conditions for this to happen, even if it's not exactly the same? So there are two things that you're right. always trying to look for, what is necessary and what is sufficient. Amazing. Um, and we learned that, yeah, you know, you can take something that as long as it has 
the ability to process symbols. You can make it run around an environment and it can learn essentially a language of those environments to the point that it will then reply to you, you know, look, a triangle. And it is, so you, you say you have yeah. a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old yes, but casting yeah. your mind back to the first bit of language of the doggy, look at the doggy. First, the I doggy. remember the first word was dada. Oh, and you're always so happy. So happy. You're like, yes. yes. And then you realise that they all say dada first. And like, but, yes, but it just proves what an important role it is that you take the first sound that babies make and they make that the name of your role. Absolutely. It shows how Absolutely. much you value. How did the, all your, your swearing stuff come into your neuroscience and AI and all that? So the other thing, without making me sound even weirder than I do already, uh, that I'm fascinated by is pain. Uh, pain. And how, yes, what in neuroscience literature tends to be referred to as aversive stimulus. Right. Uh, but they mean pain or things that yeah. are shitty happening to you. Yeah, yeah. And how that... So f physical and mental. Physical and mental. And yeah. there's some really cool research. I think I managed to mention it in the book. I'm not sure. When you look at the activation in the brain when people have physical versus social pain, it's very, very similar. And we know from various different experiments that you can make social pain, i.e. things like break up from a relationship or, you know, grief, actually responds to things like paracetamol. A, a clinical dose of paracetamol will make you feel less sad really? um, when it is a social pain. But the killer experiment for this like pain research is I just, is that just I like a it. placebo effect or an actual oh, like that was a, a really important question is there something physically similar about social and physical pain so what they did was there is a well-known phenomenon that if you experience a mild pain like and they usually use a sort of mild burning pain or a mild electric shock or these very carefully calibrated needles uh, in these labs if you experience a mild pain the next pain that you feel tends to feel more intense whereas if you feel a major pain the next pain that you feel tends to feel less intense and i'm no great fan of evolutionary psychology but it it does kind of make sense that if you if your leg is broken lying still and hoping that nothing is going to savage you to death is probably <laughs> yeah, yeah. a good idea whereas if you've merely stubbed your toe then running home you as fast as you can and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but in order to test whether or not there was the same relationship between social and physical pain as there is between physical and physical pain, there was a, a brilliant experiment that just tells you everything you need to know about how evil psychologists are. Really? Yeah. So they had these people go in and they said, we're going to be doing this experiment on pain tolerance, but actually the equipment's not set up yet. So while we do that, you can do this other experiment for us if you wouldn't mind and then you were randomized to one of two conditions in the first condition it was we have this newfangled internet thing this is back in about 93 uh, and you can play this game of catch with people on the internet and all, all they do is basically you know they say your name and the ball is yours yeah. and you have to say someone else's and throw it to them except all it was was a random name generator that would just never say that person's name so they'd feel a bit left out uh. so that's a mild social pain for the major social pain, instead, they said, we have this researcher in at the moment, and they're from like Harvard, Yale, Oxford, I don't know, something with a good halo effect. And they probably even come in in a, a white coat, like quite often if you want to intensify a right. you put a white coat on. I think Ben Goldberg writes quite a lot about that. And they come in, they have this questionnaire, and they say, we have this amazing computer program. Again, early 90s, we really believed that computers would be that smart. And you fill in this questionnaire, and it will make spot on predictions about your likely life trajectory would you like to do that so they go, yes and you tick all these various boxes about you know i like to go out more than stay in or i'm kind to my friend and then they go outside rip up the bit of paper and come back in with a pre-prepared statement that says things like um you are fundamentally unlovable <laughs> everything you try to do will, uh, in your life you will fail at because you just don't have either the aptitude or the determination if you're in a relationship now it's basically doomed because you're so awful oh anyway is that the time now we've got this pain experiment harsh, harsh. harsh devastating and lo and behold those people that had, had this devastating personal statement thought that the pain was considerably less intense that those had just had a mild you know you feel a bit left out and so the researchers wrote this wonderful paper saying, yeah, we know that this strong social pain 
acts the same as a strong physical pain. There is a subsequent analgesic effect that you don't get from the mild social pain. And I was looking through this paper, I was going, please tell me, please tell me you told them at the end it was a setup. Please tell me you told Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> it's like looking for the bit where it's like, and all participants were fully debriefed as to the nature of the experiment. But, but the think, damage was done. Like, even I mean... so, you're still going to wake up at night, aren't you? Go, oh, what yeah. if I really am? Just in case they were... <laughs> Right. Yeah. But I was reading. I've been reading the happiness hypothesis, mm. John, Jonathan Haidt's book, and uh, and one of the, one of the things he was saying was that people who experience trauma early in life are much better prepared to deal with it later on in life, which kind of seems to link to. I think yeah. I mean, my my brother and I both both grew up in the same household, and we dealt with things very differently. Um, either you go, that's the worst bloody thing that could ever happen to me, and nothing else could be that bad ever again. Or you end up so PTSD ridden, right? Right. That, you know, sort of going one of the other. Sort of self medication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't go around prescribing, in, you know, child no, trauma no, no, no. as a means of teaching <laughs> resilience. Because the other thing that teaches yeah. resilience is 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 secure attachment, is knowing that you are loved well. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. if as long as you have someone who can help you through the inevitable not necessarily inevitable but the likely things like ptsd and major trust issues and let's face it depression yeah. Yeah, yeah um then yes that sort of resilience of going i got through that it's good to go through tough it, stuff right it's, i think it's probably inevitable it's just the timing of where it comes in your life and a lot of it i guess is to do with the how how plastic your brain is at that point i mean we, we our, bla- our brains are plastic throughout yeah, life yeah. but if you, I was interested in what Emily was saying, that she'd up until graduating from university, she'd just done, she just excelled at everything. And then she's in this job market with a million other excellent people at that moment where she spoke about realizing she was one of a million, not one in a million. And I think, yeah, if that hits you for the first time when you don't have people around you who are gonna go, hey, it's okay, we can get you through this. I think if it happens to you the first time as an adult, yeah, that's yeah. really tough. Oh, it's yeah, you get smacked straight in the face. Like totally. it's real life. Standing on a rake. It's not yeah. a Disney movie. No. You know, no. you used to get you know, they, they give like prizes at school for finishing last often. Right. And some you know, like they're programming kids to and then you get into the real world mm-hmm. and if it doesn't work out, you get made redundant. Yeah. If you don't put the effort in, you know, you just got to, it's yeah. different. I think yeah. there are different ways of teaching resilience. One is the whole sink or swim. Uh, and it is that's yeah, one of yeah. the few things that in um, neuroscience or in psychology, the the common phrase is used. So we have aversive stimulus sink. for pain, but sink or swim is, oh, and my favorite one for lift, live fast, die young is an accelerated live life fast, history. die young. Yes. We, we I rest s- when I die. It, well, it's basically things like people who take a lot of drugs, drink a lot, have yeah. a lot of riscuous sex. And, and, yeah. But instead of saying, you know, and these people who tend to have live, fa- live fast, die young, it's an accelerated life history. But sink or swim, I mean, that is one way of teaching resilience, but it has a high attrition rate because not everybody swims um, True. whereas teaching kids perseverance and the idea that you get knocked down but you get up again ain't never going to keep you down i mean yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah. chumba wumba should be on the syllabus frankly um because that idea that you get through life without ever getting knocked on your ass is that just doesn't so happen yeah. there's a guy called jacko willick he's an american ex-army guy right. but super motivational and he does a podcast for kids uh-huh. So um, a guy I met yesterday told me about it from like probably a good for like from six, seven years old. And he's like, he's the guy that you want to tell your kids, like, keep going, yep. get up, you know, like in that kind of American, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to start <laughs> playing it to my uh, my kids when they're old enough. Yeah. Just get them fired up and ready. I keep, I get very mad because a lot of stuff that's aimed particularly at young girls, and you're probably noticing it now, is that, you know, she dreamed it, so she achieved it, or she thought she could, so she did. And it's like, bullshit. Uh, the most motivational yeah. poster I'd ever seen was in the window of a pharmacy, and it was for like the creatine supplements oh, or yeah. something. And it says, you don't get what you wish for, you get what you work for. Yeah, And I was true. like, you know, sort of modulo the, uh, the inherent uh, inequalities in society and the lack of a level playing field. But still, yes. Go for the you FM. don't get what you wish for. Back in the day when, I mean, now, you know, you walk out your door, you're not going to get eaten by a lion or whatever. Yeah. Back in the day, it was, it was really sink or swim. Yeah. You had to, you really had to go for it. Yeah. And the ones that survived the most resilient, the ones that didn't. Yeah. I mean, obviously now it's slightly different. Actually, it's but. interesting. It seems as though as well, because particularly in a lot of societies where it is still very sink or swim, the most valuable skill you have is being liked. 
And that, you know, and that's slightly worrying because it seems like that's been hacked a bit in you know, Boris Johnson's affable persona being at odds with whether or not he actually has everybody's best interests at heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that ability to be cared for by the tribe, which is the reason why you know, so kids have big eyes, but also kittens and puppies look so damn cute. We have it in us to want to protect the genetic investment that we've just made. Of course. Um, yeah, yeah. And remaining liked yeah. throughout your life is likely to make you survive, whereas being ostracised. And again, I think this comes back to the social pain. Why, why would social pain be so painful? Ostracism was death. Being ostracised by your tribe was death back in the day. If you're not involved in the hunts, if you don't get to share the spoils of that, if you don't have someone to take care of you, if you break your leg, you're dead. Yeah, um, yeah. And that idea, that fear of being disliked still drives us a lot. It's and huge. It is. Yeah, even I mean, for adults. In fact, my, my daughter went to a kid's party. I won't mention who the kid was in case their parents are listening. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the kid came up to my wife and my daughter and said to my wife, I don't like Florence. I find her really annoying and I don't want her at my party. This is like a five-year-old's kind of party. Yes, when it, yeah. And she was like, or four or five, and she was like a little bit like young to really know, to really care. Mm-hmm. But, but then she came back home because I wasn't there. And she said, oh, daddy, like this girl said that she doesn't like me. She didn't want my party and find her really, and then she finds you really annoying. And so it's quite interesting because you want to try and teach your kids to not, give a shit you know, so I said to, I ended up saying to her look no everyone has good taste and if she yeah. doesn't want to play with you that's her loss go play with someone else yeah, yeah easy to say obviously yeah. very different to, to yeah. actually you know yeah. not sweat those kind of things And it is it's swimming upstream against you know sort of human nature but it is really important that kids know that being like because again be, you know it's making someone do something in order to be liked is another way that, you know, groomers groom, bullies bully, gets git. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, dear, well, if you don't like, my, my daughter's favourite threat at the moment, she's three and a half, is I'm not your friend anymore. Oh yeah, classic. I, I don't mind because I'm not your friend. I'm your mum, which means I love you, and I want you to be okay and to be healthy and to be well. And if that means that you don't like me right now, that's fine because that's secondary to me. And she's at that point, she's like, ah, I'm not listening anymore. <laughs> yeah. like, it's amazing how that develops mm, so early on. So early on. And yeah, and I know it's something that is used by the kids in nursery to try to keep each other in line. Yeah, My yeah. favourite one is the five-year-old in our house is in year one of school now. And um, it's it's a very nice school and it's literally round the corner. And we're like, oh God, we really hope ours gets in. But the catchment gets tiny every yeah, year because yeah. all the siblings. And they only have 30 in their entry. And I, oh, my life has become so middle-class parent, I'm sorry. <laughs> but... The, the older one's way of keeping the younger one in line is going, do you know what, behaviour like that, they won't let you go to my school. <laughs> and she, she says the name of her school in, and she, she says, pronounces it in such, you know, like it's the, the promised land. <laughs> and it's, oh, and my daughter immediately is like, okay, I, I will behave then. And the, and the, the sort of cousin is like, you know, you, you know, if you don't, if you're not good, you won't get to go to my school. <laughs> Oh, and it's, I'm really worried in case we don't fall in the catchment. And <laughs> she ends up going to a different school and she's scarred for life, believing Well, you have to frame the story evil. that she's actually gone to a better school. <laughs> better school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. How's, how's all the swearing come into your life? Oh, it's amazing. I finished the book. So I'd signed And your book's called Swearing is Good for You. That's right. Yeah. The amazing science of bad language. And it is amazing. It is. I'm still, even now, years after writing it, flabbergasted by some of the research. Um, but I sold the book to uh, well I had an agent who was amazing uh, he sold the book in oh gosh about 20 either uh, late 2015 early 2016 wow, wow. Um, and how long did no it... earlier than that sorry 14 15 right. but, but just as I became pregnant and I, <laughs> I said to the um, the editor I'm due to give birth on the like <laughs> 3rd of March and I know my deadline is the 1st of April but don't worry I'll push it forward I'll finish it early and she went don't worry no nobody finishes early first time authors definitely don't finish early and I was like you haven't met me <laughs> <laughs> and I finished it I was like bouncing on the yoga ball for like the last sort of two chapters of edits but yeah I shipped it 
about two weeks before my daughter was due and then she nice. was like 10 days late <laughs> oh no <laughs> <Really bored. laughs> at least you um, got to chill out a little bit but yeah but because of the way that you know I think this is something that I certainly didn't realise until I got into writing books because I'd done yeah. a bit of journalism before and right. obviously I'd done academic publishing but the time scales for writing a book are much closer to academic publishing than they are to journalism unless you're doing something super timely in which case it's rushed out right there's like it takes about a year for the typesetting the cover design the marketing the sales and all the rest of it so it didn't come out until my daughter was about one and a half no oh. yeah actually about one and a half um, so but swearing already? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> nearly. Um, it wasn't long after, but it did. But that was kind of great because it meant I got a year of focusing on being a mum before the inevitable sort of publicity. Yeah, hit. yeah, and you got to hit that. Yeah. Um, and then when it did, you know, I was much more able to go and talk at things like I've talked at New Scientist Live and the Royal Society, but I've also talked at sorry, the Royal Institution. Not the shouldn't get that wrong but I also did Stylist Live nice and that was awesome because I had a room of I don't know maybe about 200 predominantly women I think maybe a couple of guys in there yeah and we're so used to this idea again you know you've got to be seen to be light and you're not supposed to moan too much and you're supposed to be quite self-deprecating and so we have a tendency to not be honest with each other about the things that are getting us down so what I did was at the beginning of the talk I had everyone write down something that was really annoying them and then just screw it up and put it on the floor and I did the talk and there's this brilliant comedian Jessica Foster-Q who was the the chair Nice. and we talked about swearing we talked about life she talked about comedy and then about five minutes before the end I said okay everyone pick up your piece of paper from the floor and throw it at us and what we'll do is we'll open it we'll read it out and all together we're gonna say fuck that shit <laughs> nice. and so the women are sort of like you know i do all the housework fuck that shit harvey <laughs> weinstein fuck that shit and then the very last one and i couldn't have gone for the bathos if i had tried it was like you know sexual harassment fuck that shit unequal pay fuck that shit pepper pig fuck that shit <laughs> And it was just this whole room. And afterwards, all these women go, it's amazing. I didn't know that other women would be as angry about this as me. And it's like, that's how they get you. Yeah. By being, you know, you're not supposed to be angry about stuff because it's so unladylike, so unattractive. We don't we don't band together and go, no, we're all pissed off about Also, this. swearing like that feels so good. It does. And when you look at, there's a brilliant study that I did get to keep in the book, which is um, looking at if you randomise whether or not the same sentences are ostensibly said by a man or a woman, then men and women alike judge the ones that are ostensibly said by a woman as being much worse, much more offensive, much more appalling than the ones said by the guy. And you also say, if you heard a man say this, what would you think about his intelligence, his self-control, whether or not you'd want to date him? Uh, And guys are completely unimpacted by any of those things. Right. You know, whatever language they choose to whatever use. Whatever language they yeah. choose to use. They're still smart. They're still in control. They're still worth dating. Whereas women, it's like, oh, she's obviously not smart. She's obviously not in control. There's no way in hell I'd date her. And it's bizarre because what we're like in private is not, you know, we women swear. And so women and men think the same about it's a guy. Bizarre. Yeah. yeah. We And we tend as women to think that you know to, to the number of women who say oh, I'm sorry I'm really sweary and it's like I, it, we all are it's just we're trained to women are trained to lie about it or so that's a social thing then it seems to be I mean when the research was initially done on the rates of swearing um, this was largely done in psychology departments where most of the professors were male and they would have co-educational groups talking about the sort of 1960s right, so. right uh, and they would ask their male and female students, you know, what kind of language do you use and how do you express yourself when you're angry? And men would go, oh, yeah, I swear. I'll swear occasionally. I'll swear about, you know, a bad sports match or I'll swear about things at work. And we were like, no, I would never, ever, ever swear. <laughs> Until, I can't remember the name of the researcher, but she was one of the first women to study this area. And she went, all right, so do you swear and the women went god yeah i swear when i'm on my period i swear when my boyfriend's an asshole i swear when my you know when my um you know turning my paper and it gets a bad grade it's like we we swear about exactly the same things as guys swear about plus pms and then there's a paper about 15 years later 
called Why Do Women Swear? by these couple of male psychologists from the Netherlands. They were just like, we're just trying to understand why women swear. And it's like, no one's ever asked why men swear. Weird. Um, but it's, seen, it's still seen as weirdly aberrant among women. But the statistics show when you do corpus analysis yeah. of just speech that is collected in the wild and then transcribed and you look through them women use just as much swearing as men we use slightly different forms but we do right. use as much yeah, swearing yeah. as men how does it affect us so there are a number of different ways it affects us but the most striking and the one that is most comprehensively demonstrated is how it affects your ability to deal with pain so there's a guy in uh keel university so this links back to your your pain oh thing. that's how i got into yeah, swearing yeah, yeah. in the yeah. first place because um, the lab I was in, we were based out of the Science Museum and we were looking to do um, things for their lates when they open with, yeah, yeah, no, you know, yeah. for over 18s and there's a bar. And like, can you do some experiments with the members of public? And it's like, you can, but we can't use the data because depending on at what point of the night you collect the data, the, it's a ver- that's a very strong proxy variable for how pissed people are. <laughs> Right, so yeah, yeah. you don't have good data from those, but it does let them see how experiments are set yeah, up, and it allows yeah. you to talk about the importance of a control and to talk about the importance of changing the order of presenting things and how big a number of people you need to participate to uh, to know if this is a, a genuinely in effect or not. So it was a good conversation point, but also it meant that I got to get a load of uh, Imperial undergrads. Uh, a lot of imp- single nice. Imperial right. students would go, so largely men, um, <laughs> but stick their hands in ice cold water for as long as they possibly could and see, you know, sort of varying degrees of machismo, which is very fun. Um, so it's you, the ice bucket test. The then. ice bucket test, that's right. Yeah. And, um, and you can indeed keep your hand in for about a third to half as long again if you're swearing than if you're just using a neutral word and I've done this at so many different wow. as talks now my favourite one was I think it was the Royal Institution one where there was a a lady of a, a certain age I'd say I, I don't want to guess at her age but you know she was she was a little older than me so maybe 50s and um, and she was great she just effed it up she was she was amazing she went for it and i was like yes blow the so good. but also she kept so she kept her hand in there for a really long time <laughs> she yeah. was really tough i see a lot of people doing ice baths because it's supposed yeah. to be really good for you and but they get through it with breathing in through their nose yes. and out through their mouth but this is the thing like, should they just swearing, be swearing instead not, not as much, swearing isn't the only thing that's analgesic there are things like taking analgesia or yeah. mindfulness mindfulness yeah, 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 meditation yeah. is also really good i'm not saying that yeah. swearing is the one and only way to kill pain but it is demonstrably effective yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um I, I was so off brand though when i did finally give birth to my daughter after 10 days like you were 10 days late darling um <laughs> And um, I didn't swear once, and I was really? in labour for like seventy-two hours. And wow. I said to my my husband and my housemate, who was some birth partner, saying, "Can you can you count how many times I swear? Because I'm convinced that there'll be this nice sort of graph depending on how hard the contractions are." Yeah, I didn't swear once because I I went so because you're bre- much for the, breathing for the and the mindfulness stuff. Yeah. Wow. And it so it worked well. It, it it actually went really well. Um, that and all of the gas and air in the world. Um, <laughs> but I think, I can't remember whether I got to update this before it was published. I'd put a footnote either there or maybe it was in an article I wrote saying, I've discovered that the secret to a relatively painless birth is to have a long, thin baby with a tiny head. Well, I yeah. mean, all this stuff about, oh, did you manage it naturally? Oh, did you manage it without... It's like, did you get through it without dying and without your baby dying? That's, That's the most important success. thing. 100%. And this 100%. whole idea of birth shaming can go die in a ditch. Well, you can't. I mean, you, you try to do it naturally, and if you can't, then you've got to get out. You, I mean, yeah, exactly. You do it in the way that... That's talking like, that you're, like I know. I mean, obviously, I'm never going to be able to actually have one myself, but... But you know, you 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 have you have been either present at. I've or been there. You, I've yeah. been there a couple yeah. of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. it is at the at the time, you know, just oh, this idea that there are certain things like. Uh, I think the guys are swearing probably more. Yeah. Like okay. shit, shit. Keep I, it going. I, I vomited all over, and I, 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 I did. Des- he swear at you? I destroyed everybody. <laughs> um, I don't remember them swearing, but I do still. I do still get reminded that. Um, I have destroyed uh, various items of clothing belonging to <laughs> my husband, my birth partner. Oh, so wow. yeah, so three and a half years ago, I should, I should buy my fun. new coat and be done. Fun. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> crazy. Um, Someone was telling me that like swearing has existed for like a ridiculous amount of time. It's certainly in our very oldest language. And it's interesting because it tends not, for obvious reasons, you know, swearing is usually the kind of thing that is highly emotive and you tend yeah. to use it only in non-formal situations. So it's not in official records, but as soon as you look at graffiti... Uh, oh, that's true. So you wouldn't you wouldn't write, like, you wouldn't write it in an official document, typically. Don't you, there have just... been trends. There have been some particularly... Uh, in in regal documents, uh, there are, and I'm not an historian on this, but there, there's um, a guy called John Gallagher who has a lovely thing of court records about people either being tried for swearing or something called flighting, where swearing was done essentially as a kind of an after dinner entertainment in right, the right, royal uh. courts. Um, so there were times when swearing has actually been the height of cultural interest That's, yeah yeah but um, always a thing not to do but or, but or the there is the idea or... that you're doing it transgressively right yeah, yeah you know yeah. the same way of like sort of throwing rotten fruit at your jester it's like you know you're breaking some kind of social bond but yeah, the idea yeah. being that you're so wealthy and you're so powerful that who the hell is going to stop you yeah uh, and even now it is used in different ways depending on, you know, the the company you're in and your socioeconomic class of, you know, am yeah. I using this defiantly or am I using this as a means of showing that I have no one that I need to be defiant to? Yeah. And so there's a dip in frequency of swearing around the middle classes oh, right. <laughs> where well, there is neither that feeling for defi- of defiance but nor that feeling of absolute entitlement. And so the middle classes swear less than either... Uh, working class or, or interesting very moneyed wealthy and it's just nice uh, to be yourself it is and I think like and for a lot of people swearing isn't part of what they're like you know a lot of people come up go, I never really swear yeah, and it's I swear like a bit. do you do you get angry at things like no and it seems to be the thing that stops you from swearing is actually just being generally pretty chill and as someone with zero chill I just I'm, I am envious I think I'm quite ch- I'm pretty chilled out pretty but chill. I do like to swear Right. Like my mum, my mum works uh, in our office too. She's, right. not, she's not here today, um, and she's always telling us swear to too much. She's like, "Don't fucking come into the office today. It's about swearing." Um, <laughs> but she always tells me I swear too much in the office. Right. Um, but I like. But I, you know, there's some good research on this. I mean, there's some lovely papers, largely from the Antipodes, which is brilliant. It's like exactly where you'd expect them from. <laughs> it's like Australia, New Zealand, and also Ireland doing research on how swearing helps with teamwork. Either really? the, the Irish study uh, is about swearing and how it helps rugby teams work together. But particularly, depending on the way that the swearing is used, if it's used judiciously, and if it's never used to sort of kick down, it's more about expressing solidarity or sympathy or frustration, then it helps teams function really well. Yeah. Um, and we know this partly because of brilliant study that looked at the highest performing teams in factory workplaces and found that particularly those that you know, had fewer uh, episodes of absenteeism and that were able to recover when the line went down badly or when you know something wasn't working were those in which swearing was taken seriously as a social signal either that someone needed some extra help or someone's feeling a bit frustrated or it really is time to yeah. work a bit harder now whereas if you just permanently pepper everything you know use it basically as punctuation it doesn't have a stronger signal Right, right. So, so you've got to choose carefully when you use your swear carefully. words. I mean, anecdotally, there's... Um, I can't remember which um, military figure it was, but his uh, subordinates always knew it was trouble when he stopped swearing. <laughs> and again, there is kind of research on that, that when you look at a lot of things, retrospectives of either black box recordings or people who've been... Surgeons who've been carrying out surgery, yeah. that the people who were usually quite sweary when they stop swearing is usually a sign that their stress levels have now gone beyond the ability to make clear um, wow. clear decisions or to think clearly. Yeah, uh, yeah. So if someone suddenly goes very quiet... Again, my family knows when <laughs> I've done something really bad. I d- <laughs> oh, Just don't say in- anything. <laughs> oh, we moved into our new house and... Um, <laughs> I didn't realise there were those sort of sticky mouse traps. Down. Oh, the really, really, yeah. And I put my hand on one, oh. and it also had a bit of mouse tail left. Oh. In it. And, and my housemate said he just heard me go, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I knew. 
beyond <laughs> swearing. It it's beyond swearing. Not good. Because, yeah, this was, oh, oh, oh that's no. not good. And also, I came off my bike just over a year ago and I hit. Cycling. Cycling, Cycling yeah. yeah. And knocked myself unconscious. And my last thought, I remember before the darkness swallowed me up, was. <laughs> Well, this isn't good. And I thought, this is so <laughs> off brand. I was very annoyed. That's with a myself. moment to swear. Be uh, like, oh shit! It was really sad that both my daughter's first moments in this world and what I thought were going to be my last moments in the world had led to no swearing whatsoever. So I'm just a massive hypocrite. Is what we can take from that. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Why? Do, why do the kids find it so funny? My, I've got. Like, I swore the other day. On, well, I just swore. I can't remember why. I was doing about to do a half marathon, and my mate was coming and we were like oh shit we better go uh-huh. and then it was like we paused and it's then the like pause. I think yeah it's yeah. the pause I realised it was me I was like paused <gasps> and then and then the two kids and then the two kids looked and they were like shit shit <laughs> 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 It, it, maybe it was me I, you it's, know it's, it's like, the emotional power that the words have and the best thing you can do if you don't want to have them pick the word up is to not draw attention to it yeah 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 um, it's too late now though. but it's too late Once and the best absolutely the best thing you can do and again brilliant research on this from a couple in the states um, the Jays um Professor and Professor J. I can't remember. We're going to have to put thing. all of these uh, studies in the show notes Absolutely. later. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but they looked at the best ways of dealing with swearing and saying to your child, never let me hear you swear. All that does is mean that they swear, but not around you. Whereas right, sitting right. down and talking to your children about and going, it sounds like you're having some very strong feelings right now. And I think that works in two ways. First of all, they understand that there are other ways of expressing their feelings and what it was that triggered the swearing, but also they don't want to swear because they know it's going to lead to a half hour deep meaningful about their feelings. Which... Uh, <laughs> but it's also um, not the done thing. Like if I went to yeah. my mate's house and my kids started swearing, yeah, like they can be like, oh, you haven't brought your kids up well. And like, this is the thing. Swearing. I still think that, you know, for some reason. It's all socially accepted. Yeah. As a pe- uh, for a parent to let their kids swear without you saying something. Yeah. That like you feel like you've got to say, don't say that. Don't or... say that. Whereas, yeah, I still think saying, you know, why did, why did you say that? It's always a good one. But they're but always laughing after it. They it's are like a like, funny. They said it because it's funny. It's like poo, I... poo, shit. I know. My, my daughter told me the other day that her and her friend just got her frenemy. She's three and a half. She's got a frenemy. This is depressing. But they were sitting under the table and they were hiding from their teacher and they're saying bum bum to each other. And I said, why were you saying bum bum to each other? Were you saying it to make the other person angry or sad? Or were you doing it to make each other laugh? And she said, to make each other laugh? And I was like, well, that's fine. You know, yes, your yeah. teacher doesn't want to hear it. Yes, please don't teach it to the toddlers because you're preschoolers now. You have certain responsibilities to the young ones. <laughs> Let's see. I'm just laying it on the thick. Um, but yeah, it's like, why are you doing it? And I would much rather that, you know, that kids swear than that they actually just be mean to each other. Yeah. And, that, and look, let's be honest, they're going to swear. They are. At some point in their life. Yeah. So they might as well start early. Absolutely. It's like drink, <laughs> drugs, alcohol, sex, swearing. Get it in early. You just, <laughs> you just, you really want them to kind of learn about it from you and not make the dumbass mistakes that you made growing up. But you also True. know that at some point they're going to make a highly because you don't learn things from people telling you stuff. You learn things through emotional experiences. That's true. Or life lessons. Yeah. No, anyway. that's very true. And you don't want Peppa Pig teaching them either. No, no, no. God. No, no. Oh, poor hen peck daddy pig. <laughs> <laughs> I watch far too much of that. I think. I watched Do You Know with Maddie Moat, which is brilliant. I haven't seen that. So, it's brilliant. That and Octonauts. I've learned an awful lot of marine Octonauts. biology from Octonauts. Yeah, yeah. Octonauts. Some good uh, stuff. Maddie, Maddie Moat. I now know how. Um, how wax crayons are made and how glass is made and and it's absolutely fascinating and my daughter absorbs it like a sponge because she's the right age for it and then she tells me this stuff back about whale sharks or how fish cakes are made they do remember a lot they do and it's they do remember a lot yeah but then a lot of a lot of parents don't want their kids to watch stuff yeah I we mean, had a conversation recently where a parent said that we don't let our kids watch any tv see screen time and i, I was I'm like just, uh, uh, and then i was like oh shit <laughs> um i was probably watching a little bit too much well i'm i'm reading a load of studies on this at the moment uh, are you yeah so what's the, uh, so the scientific two, view is is that it's going to be on kids brains and how they change throughout childhood um 
So just sitting and watching TV doesn't help with acquiring language or social skills or anything. But watching programming that's specifically designed for particularly preschoolers with an interested adult is really helpful. With it, with it, the adult watching with them. But it's the parent being there watching it with them. So it's kind of like... Really? How, only, why is that... Um... So it's the discussions that you have while watching. Right. So putting that stuff into context. So my daughter is now really fed up of me ruining all the fairy stories. Like, well, but why doesn't Cinderella's glass slipper turn back at midnight? Like the rest of it, I don't understand this. Why is why is it that they didn't change at midnight? Mama, just tell a story. Um, but actually having those sorts of conversations, you do end up sort of indoctrinating your kids into the kind of thought that you yeah. tend to have without meaning to. Yeah. But you hear yourself back. <laughs> but is it better it's better to let them start to think for themselves, right? It is, but by asking questions, by prompting lines yeah, of yeah. thought. You know, so why why Some nice open questions. Yeah. Or, yeah. Why is Quasi so scared? Because he's utterly neurotic. Um, yeah, a, so, yeah. so, compl- so, so real lazy parenting, let's uh-huh. say in inverted commas, is just sticking your kid in front of the TV. You go chill out on your phone somewhere on Instagram it's, and they're watching Peppa or something. It's bad. It's, it's the any time when... Uh, not any time, but there is something called the 30 million word gap, which is probably wildly exaggerated. Uh, but there was a study done in the mid 90s looking at the amount of speech directed at children that children hear and they found that between the families that spoke most with their children and the families that spoke least with their children by the time those children got to school the ones who'd been spoken to most had 30 million words more that they'd heard directed to them than the ones who were spoken to least because we know that kids can't don't learn language from overheard speech they only learn it from speech from conversations that you have direct speech that's why you can't just stick them in front of france french tv and hope that they'll become bilingual (laughs) you have to be having these conversations yes yeah and that gap is then correlated with how well they do when they get to school even you know not just how well they can express themselves and how well they can understand language but also how good they are at abstract thought how good they are at mathematics how good they are at just sitting and paying attention to what someone's saying. So it used to be that this was highly correlated with socioeconomic status. So people who were had the most stressful lives, who were on benefits, who or you know were scrabbling from uncertain paycheck to uncertain paycheck for obvious reasons do not have time to spend an hour when they get home from work having a teddy bear's picnic with their kids <laughs> you know it's like you're desperately ju- and the house i grew up in was like that you're yeah. just trying to stay afloat yeah yeah whereas yeah. a comfortable middle class like me you know we can we can sit and we can watch octonauts together <laughs> because i pay someone to do my cleaning you know i i we can we can go around the supermarket together slowly because I don't have to work on the weekends. We can have all of these conversations because I'm so fucking privileged. But that big gap is starting to be less correlated with socioeconomic status and more correlated with how long parents spend on their phones. Um, And the time that you spend with your kid, particularly in that first year when they're not talking to you, but you're talking to them, it's so important that you talk to them because that's what teaches them language. There are some other fantastic studies about how caregivers talk to their kids during various different activities. And reading it, I got like this kind of flashback to maternity leave, but you use the same essentially sort of 20, 30 words over and over again while you're doing nappy changes and another 20 or 30 while you're having a bath and another 20 or 30 while you're eating and more but the same sort of ones while you're reading books, you know, doggy, piggy, etc. And it's that regularity, that sheer mind-numbing repetition that kind of kills you in that first yeah, year. Yeah. But it's that that teaches them that language. T- yeah. I love that. Why is it that people talk to babies like babies? Oh, this is great. So it kind can- of annoys me, but I don't know if I should annoy me or not. It will annoy you as an adult because yeah. it's not designed for you to hear. But, and oh, it, so this is the chance that I get to have a go at Stephen Pinker. So <laughs> there's this one study, and it's barely even worth the name of a study. Um, it's one person was interviewed in uh, New Jersey, I think it was New Jersey, uh, but a black American 
woman, I think, I'm not sure gender is disclosed, but she's not even a caregiver. She's not a main caregiver of any child. And she said, you know, I don't see why, and none of my friends see why we should talk to children in this stupid way. They don't know anything yet. Wait until they've learned stuff and then you can start asking them questions. And for years, Pinker and other Chomskyites have been going, oh, you see, there is something magic in babies' brains that means that they learn language because they can't possibly learn it from the way that adults talk it because adults speak in a way that is disjointed and degenerate and messed up and grammar's all wrong and they have these horrible run-on sentences like this one that no baby could ever make sense of. But for 20 years before Chomsky posited this, there'd been women doing research on women who had been raising children going mother it was even called mother ease so we now know that dads talk like this and granddads and grandmas and nursery workers and everybody talks like this to kids even if you feel like a dick doing it and that the way we speak to kids is not the way we speak to adults child directed speech is massively important and it's been found in every single culture in the world so Chomsky and Pinker are going oh it's just these white middle class women who do this it's not it's just that white middle class women were the first people studied to be doing it but it's found on every continent and it's found in all relationships of caregiving including older siblings and the patterns of this speech are so brilliantly designed to extend something called prosody so what are the rhythms of speech that allow you to work out where the words begin and end so when you go to spain if you speak spanish you can hear the words if you don't speak spanish you hear a stream of noise and you've no idea where the words begin and end that was a huge like how how is chunking done and that was one of the arguments for this innate grammar is that you couldn't possibly chunk um, because adult speech is continuous. Speech to babies is not. It's hugely exaggerated. There's also this idea that you wouldn't know which were the important words in a sentence. Well, child-directed speech is hugely repetitious. We have this thing where we go, look at the doggy, the doggy, oh, what a cute doggy. And you just like, the word doggy is really important here. To emphasise it, yeah. To the extent that... There was a study about 10 years ago where they were, we're going to take the exact same pairs of sentences in Chinese, in Mandarin, have a Mandarin speaker speak them, but she's going to speak them as if she was speaking to an adult, and then she's going to speak them as if she was speaking to a child, and they are things like, here is your bottle, get your bottle. This is a horse, what a big horse. So she's going, in Mandarin, yeah. Here is a horse, what a big horse. And then child directed he's a big horse what a big horse and then they tested english speakers not who had never learned any mandarin or any form of chinese whatsoever on whether or not they'd learned any of these words and the ones that heard infant directed speech learned about 70 percent of the words just from hearing two sentences the ones who heard adult directed speech didn't learn them at all wow so we know even cross-linguistically there is something about that infant directed speech that allows you to pick out the important words that become the building blocks then of syntax, of expression. And then later on, pragmatics is a brilliant paper. I haven't read all the way yet. I've only read the abstract, but how kids teach their parents irony and sarcasm. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. I'm so glad sh- I'm not the only one doing I that. I love that. So you should you should speak like that to kids. It helps them. It really? really helps them. It is the scaffolding that allows them to make sense of what you're saying. And it is the reason why they pick out swear words, because swear swear words have their own prosody they tend to be louder more exaggerated often said either very slowly or very quickly um my daughter i know has do you speak to her her differently still i still speak mm, i do what's the kind of this is interesting loads of research on how parents change the way they speak to their kids and they thought that this would be on a month-to-month basis quite often it's on a day-to-day basis as they're learning language so you start by using largely single words or pairs or triplets of words then you start to use more complicated things as they start to say pairs or triplets of words then you start to ask questions as they start proffering words and then as they start asking questions you start answering them differently and i'm at the stage of something called recasts and you probably are too which is when your kids say something that's right but slightly ungrammatical uh, i i, I buy yeah. this from the shop oh you bought that from the shop did you and you don't notice you're doing it but you don't say don't say by did say bought 
you just don't because that all that does is make kids not want to speak if you try to do formal prescriptive grammar at them they just go i don't know how to do it you just reply with oh you bought that did you and talking about the cell assemblies earlier what you're doing then is you're create it you you're kind of going okay you have this pattern of of activation that is to do with you having previously purchased an item i am replacing the sounds that go with that right you have bided i'm telling you it's bought but you don't say that you just it's called recasting it's a repeat but where you repeat it correctly but but then the the tone of your voice is that the same as if you were to speak to me or See, this is the thing, because I wouldn't expect to recast for you being an, an adult yeah, yeah. speaker of your native language, but I guess if you if you said, oh, you bought these microphones. You know, or, uh, oh, I, I, saw, I saw John yesterday, and you oh, you mean I, you saw James yesterday. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, yeah, of, see there. And again, you can hear that you put more emphasis on James, because I'm con- contradicting you. And I think it's pr- I would have to see if anyone's actually studied the prosody of this, because it's very labour intensive you have yeah. to record hours and hours right. of people speaking to their kids get some and, ai to do it yeah i mean you can do that for looking for stuff in transcripts yeah but tone of voice tone, yeah. is so hard yeah, yeah um but yeah i'm trying to think at least anecdotally it's like oh, i buy did this oh you bought that did you i think bought you probably you go up but, in tone and yeah it's interesting i've been thinking about it a lot my, my 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 sister has a young kid and and she still speaks to him like a baby because yeah. he's a baby and then as your kids get older I'm now having proper conversations with my five year olds like proper chats yeah. you know, how come this is like that and yeah. how come the sky's blue and why is this and then then you actually have to really sit down and answer properly oh my favourite one to, my favourite response to that is I don't know how could we find out good answer and um, because I'd rather that than bullshit <laughs> um, apart from at bedtime my daughter knows that why is my kryptonite and it's, I can't, I find it really hard not to at least respond to a question. And so she'll be trying to go to sleep and she'll come up with things like, Mummy, why are there feet? And it's like, what? Go to sleep. Don't, 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 don't answer it. <laughs> what, what do you mean, why are there feet? Why, why do I have feet? What would you walk on if you didn't have, no, shh, you're, you're trolling me now. I know you're trolling me. My other one was, the other day, she was flailing her legs around, going for something about her toes, and then she went, oh, mama, my feet just kicked me in the face. <laughs> and it's like, I had to leave her room, because I'm like, if I'm just sitting here crying with laughter, that's not going to help you. It's great, you're obviously, either. you're, and you're teaching your daughter to really engage in conversation. Uh, she, she is so which is conversational. Great. They didn't I mean, teach that at school. Art of don't. conversation, interacting with people, you know, these kinds of things are brilliant. Sir. Yeah, I mean, the, the school that the five-year-old's going to, they're trying very hard to do that, and largely because of this, that there is um, occasionally a conversational deficit when kids arrive at school. And there's a programme called Every Child a Talker, which I think is still slightly controversial. Right. But this idea of getting kids to you know, sit in, what's sometimes called circle time, but to... Yeah, they might, yeah. Yeah, to circle talk time, about yeah. a thing that is important to them. The thing they do at high school is they turn to your partner and discuss it. And then, and I didn't do that till I got to university. You know, lecturers would go, oh, you talk talking groups about two or three, and then we'll take some answers. But this idea of having to lobby for your point of view, I think is brilliant when you have two kids in the same house, because they have a lot of practice if you, yeah, you they've got to don't allow snatching throwing biting or kicking it's oh, like dear. no no you have to <laughs> sort this out with words yeah they get very good art it's an amazing skill then my kid does show and tell at school yes which is really good as well but then also they have to learn to listen to yeah. whoever's talking and then so those those things are great yeah and they're starting to come through yeah and i think that the schools have realized that this is not just about conversation that your ability to process understand recast information conversation is really at the fundamentals of all of that oh and, yeah no massively listening to your kids talking to your kids and even taking their attempts at conversation seriously before they can speak there's again paper i haven't read yet it's sitting on my printer at home i meant to bring it with me to read on the tube on the way pat never mind and it's called motion ease Motion ease. Motion ease. So how adept parents are at spotting when their child's attention shifts. Oh, you've seen it, you know, you've seen a doggy, you've seen a horsey, but you're you're so attuned while your child is so tiny to them suddenly like looking over there or pointing at a thing. And parents who respond more fluently to motion ease to their kids 
you know, demonstrate it even with facial expressions that they're bored or interested or happy or cross, tend to have earlier talkers because these children seem to understand that their attempts to be understood will be taken seriously. Yeah. So yeah. even paying attention to, you know, they, they studied um, largely mothers because it's usually sort of mothers in maternity leave who have the time to show up to these labs. Um, <laughs> but just basically you can split mothers into they spend their time going look look at the glass look at my glasses look at the thing stop what you're doing and look at my thing or oh what is it you're interested in what is it you're looking at and then you follow them up six months later and the ones who followed what their kids were interested in their children were much more verbal than the ones where their parents had gone look at the flashcard look at the doggy do the th- look i bought these educational resources pay attention <laughs> oh, I see, to yeah. it's like don't talk about what your kid is interested yeah, in. yeah that's true and now i get daddy you're not listening to me oh like, i have been listening to you for the last hour yes when, when you're going to get to the point um yeah i know it's tricky it is it's very fun. tricky I, I can't there's someone who does meander i feel like i can't really criticize my daughter for not getting to the point quickly but, no it's great it is well look thank you so much for speaking to me on the podcast it's okay. awesome you're so you're finishing well your first book's available online yes yeah and then you're and on all good bookstores on all good bookstores and, and you're finishing channels. your second one now uh i'm about halfway through the second one now but cool. that won't be out until i think june 2021 because oh, okay, of the fine. length of time it takes so we'll to get you back in to speak about that would be great awesome. um but yeah if you want to know why we know that chimpanzees swear or if you want to know you know who does swear and when um, uh, or why stroke victims can still swear. Something that, you know, more people who have relatives who've had strokes or dementia should know about. It, that is crazy. When you when I read that... I'm yeah, sorry. it's it, I, the number of people who've come up to me afterwards after a talk and have gone, I didn't realise that, and now it makes a lot of sense. I just, I feel like whenever you have people who are caring for people with strokes or dementia, pointing out that they're going to become more sweary. It doesn't mean they suddenly hate you. Um, It's really important. Very, very sad story that a producer on a radio programme told me, which was that her father had had a stroke and hadn't said anything particularly coherent in all the time since until they all went out for a family picnic and a red kite swooped down and stole his sandwich and he went (laughs) fucking bastard. (laughs) But her mum was devastated. It's like, he hasn't told me he loves me. He he doesn't say my name, but he can swear at this bird. And it's like, that's because the parts of the brain that produce that kind of language are much more diffuse and have been spared the stroke. Whereas his ability to construct a sentence, being able to tell you how he feels has been devastated. So it's not that he doesn't love you. It's just that it's so much easier to tell a bird to go fuck itself. (laughs) I'm really sorry. Someone should have told you that. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that in the book. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hope you get home quicker than you got here. (laughs) And uh, speak soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.